All right, let us get started for today. My name is Beth Noel. I'm the director of marketing at MCC and I will be your host. Uh, before I pass today's event over to President Mabry, I wanted to just go over the process for participation. In order to make sure that everyone can hear clearly and there's no audio feedback, all participants have been muted. Uh, please note video and audio are being recorded. You can choose to mute your device's camera by clicking on the video camera icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. After the president's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. Please type your questions into the chat function. You can access that at the bottom of Zoom. The president and senior leadership will respond to as many questions as possible. A log of all questions submitted is being automatically generated and any questions we are unable to answer, we will um, address either individually via email or include in an upcoming college-wide email update. A recording of town hall will be available for community members who are unable to attend today and it will be accessible from the president's webpage. Now I turn the town hall over to President Mabry. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, it's great to see everybody uh, here today and uh, welcome. Um, I'm sure you're like me, there are things that keep you up at night uh, or wake you up at night. I know we have these, com these conversations in cabinet, right? Okay, what time did you wake up last night? One of the things I don't have to worry about is the work that each and every one of you is doing to support our students and keep the college moving forward. That's not what's waking me up. I mean, just looking on this screen, um, you know, I can see some of the folks here. I know Jonathan's getting 75 turkeys ready. Kelly's been feeding me lots of stuff about uh, civic engagement. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people involved in some of the um, efforts we're doing. Sherry, I've got another uh, person wants to give us a scholarship. So there's, you know, all sorts of um, good things going on because of the work that all of you are doing. If I scrolled through all seven pages, I could point out, you know, dozens of things that people are doing that are uh, really quite extraordinary uh, these days. And that's in the context of this very tough nine months that we've all been through and all the challenges that we've had to overcome uh, and all the adjustments we've had to make both in our work and our individual and personal lives. I recognize that people have children at home, that school schedules are uncertain to say the least, and keeping everyone in your family safe and well is not an easy task during these days. I know that some families have been economically impacted by the pandemic and the consequence, uh, uh, consequent recession. But through it all, I see this team really rising above and really taking the challenge on head on and really keeping this college moving forward. You are people who focus on our mission every day and I can't tell you how proud I am of the work that you do. I wanna extend my thanks to each and every one of you, all you have done and all you are doing every day to support yeah. our students. Now today we're going to cover basically five major areas. We're going to go through all of these um, as we uh, go forward and then we will handle the questions um, at the end as Beth said. So uh, that will be going on. So the first is, uh, next slide please. Really looking at the election uncertainty and how that's uh, potentially the impact on the college. Uh, the MCC budget. We're going to talk about the equity agenda briefly. Um, Patrick Cook will give an EMT update and then Mary Emmerich will give a presidential search process update. There will be plenty of time for Q&A at the end though and we are looking forward to answering any and all questions that you have today. So Beth has already given you the ground rules you know on this really that it will be recorded the link will be made available. I know that this is election day and that people may be out there voting, which is what I hope they do. Um, I know I got out and voted. Um, I was there just before they opened at seven o'clock in Bedford this morning. 
And there were probably 60 or more people in line at that point, but well organized, got right in and got my uh, vote cast. Uh, as I said earlier to folks, the only thing I was disappointed about is they didn't have any I voted stickers. So uh, other than that, we'll see how it goes. So um, again, Bethel asked the questions as a moderator and that's so she can just put them together and put some order into them. But if there are questions we don't get to, we will try to post answers on all of these. So uh, next slide. I don't have to tell uh, folks in this crowd really that this is a very disruptive election, a very divisive one. And you all are aware, I'm sure that this may intrude on your classes uh, if it has not already. Um, it reminds me somewhat, unfortunately, of 9-11 when I was teaching in the classroom. And this election really is eliciting very strong remote emotions that may override your ability to keep everyone focused on the curriculum over the next few days. Um, your students, as you know, are engaged. And there have been many activities across the college to engage them in this election and to engage them in the issues surrounding this election. So you know your students, you know how they're gonna be coming into the class and you just wanna think about how can you work with them to help them through these issues. They're again, very tuned in and they may want to talk about this. We could go on to the next slide, please there. There we go, yes. So again, you know, think about how do you actively, you know, engage them and guide these classroom discussions. You've all had those difficult discussions in your classrooms and, you know, setting ground rules and just, you know, keeping things in order will really help. Um, as we know with this really divisive election, um, it's tough to have, um, you know, non-heated disagreements. So it's gonna be, I know you're gonna have a challenge there to let all voices be heard and to keep everybody uh, polite and on topic. Um, I would also say if you can, you know, encourage your students to really have confidence in the elections and help them understand the process as much as you can. Um, voting in the United States varies by state, by community, and it can be very different in different places. So tonight, as we know, may not and most likely will not have uh, a clear outcome. Um, we want to let students know that candidates don't declare themselves the winner, that these have to be uh, certified by nonpartisan election officials and announced by nonpartisan news outlets like the Associated Press. So this year, with all the different uh, early balloting and all the uh, other forms of voting, it may take time and we may not see the winner for some time. Okay, so, you know, do everything you can to help your students uh, through this and help, you know, uh, as they wrestle with misinformation that most certainly will be out there. This is even more difficult uh, this year. So again, I know you know how to deal with this, how to stay engaged with your students. So we're monitoring this situation carefully. Um, Beth and her team are watching our social media um, channels. Uh, Pam and her team are watching the student app, app out there. Um, public safety is monitoring uh, the campuses and keeping in touch with our local communities. So we're watching this very carefully. I don't anticipate problems, but we want to make sure that we're watching this and monitoring this carefully before we go on. So this is gonna be, uh, again, something we wanna watch carefully. Make sure if you see anything or hear anything or concerned that you pass that along uh, very quickly so that we can um, deal with it and uh, be careful with it. Again, students are engaged, they're gonna be uh, involved and um, that's a good thing. Uh, we've got a lot of people voting in this country, a lot of people engaged. We'll see how the outcome comes out. Next slide, please. So uh, the budget is one of those issues that does keep me up at night, unfortunately. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how we're approaching this and how we're thinking about it. 
I don't need to remind you that the work you do every day is critical. It's critical not just to our students and their families, but really to the whole fabric of our communities. During dis disruptive times like this, when we are able to help people continue their education in an open, inclusive, and really supportive environment is something very special. And it's special for our students and it really positively impacts them and their families. Providing access to education and actively supporting our, our students is what we do best. And it really is the core of the mission and who we are. But through all of this uh, and all we've been through over the last nine months, we have stayed focused on this mission and we found new and better ways to accomplish these tasks. I know you've had to change a lot and you've embraced new technologies, you've learned lots of new processes, and it really just shows how strong you and this college community is. So I really, again, want to applaud you for all you've done, but also realize that what we have learned will help us go forward through this pandemic and once it is behind us. I also don't need to remind you how challenging this last year has been, and all this stress has been uh, caused, you know, through this. And we've seen stress for several years because of the um, de enrollment decline, which has limited the resources uh, that we have. These ongoing challenges have meant that we have undertaken many initiatives to help us become more efficient and more effective in all we do so that we can really focus as many resources as possible on our core mission of access and success. But now on top of this, the pandemic has imposed a whole new range of challenges. And once again, the MCC team is figuring it out and has really been able to help our students get not only through the spring and summer, but into the fall. People have learned how to move and succeed uh, in their remote work and remote support services. We've re revamped our classes and schedule for the fall semester. And this has really helped our students stay on track. This has all been a heavy lift for everyone at the college. And I worry about how each and every one of you are doing through all of this. It's really hard when I can't stop and check in and see people and really get a sense of how you're doing because I know this has been hard. So we now have a new set of challenges and we need to continue through this with our focus on our core mission of access and success while continuing to focus also on our equity issues all while maintaining our fiscal integrity. This is no easy task. The leadership team has been working nonstop since March and continues to find new and creative solutions to enable us to overcome each and every challenge we come up against. We're all working as a team and staying focused on that core mission. So let me turn to the current challenges we are facing. Enrollment is a key revenue driver for the college. And despite huge efforts, enrollment decline this fall was twice as large as we budgeted for. We're confident that we've learned a lot about how to attract, admit, and work with students in this new landscape, but we're swimming against a very strong tide here. The biggest factor seems to be the negative impact from the pandemic on our students. Again, the economy was really taken apart from the bottom up. Millions of service and frontline jobs that our students had are gone. Communities of color and low-income families have borne the brunt of the pandemic and the recession. And this double blow has left many of our students in quite desperate straits. And now many cannot afford to continue their education. And I worry about how badly this will impact their lives and our communities if this goes on for too much longer. Unfortunately, I do not see things coming back quickly at this point. And the longer the pandemic limits economic activity, many of these jobs 
will not come back and unemployment will remain at challenging levels. As we are seeing now, COVID-19 cases are rising again in Massachusetts and rapidly in many areas of the college that were previously less severely impacted. Without a clear national plan, the pandemic will continue to cause tremendous harm to people's health and their financial well-being. Without another stimulus package out of Washington, the Baker administration will have limited resources to support communities and public agencies across the Commonwealth. Looking at the state budget, Governor Baker has proposed level funding for public higher education. And this is usually the ground floor for what the legislature will do. So that means that usually the legislature only adds on top of what Governor Baker puts forward. So this is a good first step. While it's not a done deal yet, we still have to get through the legislative process. We are cautiously optimistic that we will not see a significant cut in our state funding this year. That said, there are a number of caveats. The state has not contributed any money to public higher ed and has only redistributed federal dollars up until this point. Uh, there has been no talk of a relief plan for public higher ed or any plan really of any shape. The state did hire a consulting firm, EY Parthenon, to examine the finances of all 15 community colleges and the nine state universities to see if everyone, if anyone, excuse me, was going to run out of operating cash. But even when asked directly, um, I, the only answer I could get was that they have not discussed what they would do if a college or university got into trouble. Basically, um, the community colleges feel like we are on our own. So our enrollment decline was about 13% from last year, which is right about the average for the 15 community colleges in Massachusetts. Most of the colleges were somewhere between 10 and 15%, uh, percent, a few less, a few much higher, but most of them somewhere in the center there. So we're all having these challenges. That leaves a budget gap for us of about $5 million from the lost tuition and fees. Last week we presented, uh, two weeks ago, we presented to the Finance Committee and last week to the Board of Trustees. And the trustees authorized us to use $2.4 million in reserve funds to reduce part of this gap. So that means we need to make about $2.6 million in budget reductions this year. So what we're doing is we're starting with cost reductions wherever possible. So, you know, there's been questions about conferences and travel. Well, that the travel part of it is gone. Um, people have been going to a few virtual conferences, but there's, that means they're very low conference fees and no travel costs. Facilities has been uh, working hard to reduce costs wherever possible, but we have to realize that there are a few buildings that are completely empty all the time. And we do have to maintain uh, certain levels of HVAC activity just to prevent problems in the buildings. There's a hiring freeze wherever possible. It's, uh, we have to recognize that we have to fill some critical positions, but we look at this very, very carefully at each instance. We are always looking to see where we can streamline our business practices and find more ways to work more efficiently with fewer resources. Because three quarters of our budget is made up of personal costs and many of the remaining costs are fixed, we will need to better align our staffing levels with our enrollment levels. Our first option is to seek to reduce personnel costs through voluntary reductions. So before Thanksgiving, um, you're going to see HR roll out some voluntary programs. These would be incentives uh, for people who are willing to retire or resign at this time. There would also be an ability to work reduced hours and there would be an ability to work a 10-month contract. 
So there's going to be a range of options. Again, these are all voluntary. There is manager of review on this. In a sense, we can't have everybody uh, choosing something in, in one area. We may have to work out some things, but we really hope that some of these will help some of our community uh, or many in our community uh, to meet the needs that they have in their personal and family lives at this time. We are doing this also because we don't see the state doing any sort of personnel actions or incentive plans. As I stated earlier, we see uh, appear to be on our own. And I've heard no talk um, from the Baker administration about this. And it just doesn't seem to be the way they operate. So we decided once again to roll this out on our own. We're gonna to try to do everything we can before we get to any involuntary staffing reductions. If we need to do any restructuring, it will always be keep, uh, with a mind, keeping a mind on our core mission and how we focus our resources on access and student success. Restructuring is always a painful process, but aligning the institution um, on the most productive ways we can meet our core mission will help us all be more focused on what we really do best. So this is going to uh, take us a while. We're going to work through this. We'll be as open, as transparent as we can on this. And we'll start, as we said, with cost reductions and with the voluntary uh, plans rolling out. I wanted to mention a little bit about the equity agenda, which is really important this year and it's going to be a consistent theme throughout the year. Activities continue, and I am pleased to see that many faculty and staff are actively participating. Across the institution, we are continuing to disaggregate our data to measure how we were doing from an equity perspective. We, uh, Phil and the uh, diversity committee uh, uh, at the board level have done some really good work looking at uh, the impact of spring and summer. The strategic planning committee continues to do its good work. And I would like to remind everybody that their first strategic direction was build a culture of equity mindedness and inclusive excellence. And that's why we're trying to bring up the equity agenda at every public gathering that we have. The Leading for Change group led by Darcy and Phil is meeting, as is the FSA Diversity Committee. Um, Dr. Dotton assures me that equity will be on the agenda at all FSA meetings. And also we understand that there are many individually led initiatives uh, to address important aspects of the equity agenda. We're also now considering uh, a request that one of the spring town hall meetings focus entirely on the equity agenda. So I want to make sure we keep that front and center and that we keep uh, thinking about how can we make MCC a more equitable place for our faculty, our staff, and our students. At this point, I would like to turn this over to uh, Patrick Cook who is going to give you an emergency um, uh, management team update. Patrick. Thanks, President Mabry. Um, before I get into that, just uh, to kind of follow up, and Beth is sending around a uh, chat message with everybody. We had a second Zoom bomber come on. So if you're receiving any messages right now from somebody you don't know in the chat function, do not answer them, just keep them disabled. And we are in the process of dealing with uh, removing them from the mix and IT is involved as well. So just um, pay attention. And if you don't know the individual, don't engage. Um, we're, we're, we're taking care of it as we go here. Um, on a different note, just wanted to kind of update folks on a, on a, on a few fronts here that um, I know a number of you have been attending the regular town meetings that we've been having. And I know a great number of you have been communicating with us regularly um, through the emergency management mailbox. And I also know a good number of you have been sitting in those Friday meetings with us or the Monday meetings with us on a number of fronts. But we, um, we always want to use this opportunity to kind of bring people up to speed with where things are. Um, we do want, you know, they're, they're um, Colleen Cox 
and Abby Vagados have been working to collect um, some of the surveys that have been submitted to folks who have been coming onto campus for any of our face-to-face -face experiences this semester. And they've been um, calling through those uh, feedback forms and some of the questions that have been raised. Um, going back to the beginning of the semester, I know a number of folks that had, uh, had questions regarding the um, air quality issues. And um, we do want to just remind folks that there was a um, air quality study that was conducted over a course of about two months on all of our buildings to make sure that the air quality was uh, satisfactory. And those results did come back with positive uh, results. Um, there was, there was an, an email sent around previously about it. But if it's not on the COVID-19 uh, micro page, we have, I'll make sure we can get the executive summary posted on that page as well. Um, the cleaning is underway daily. Our facilities team um, is working day shifts and night shifts um, with the highest priority um, cleaning areas being the common areas, but also any of the classrooms or laboratories and such that we've had um, some of the face-to-face -face experiences on since September. Um, you're going to start to see a number of uh, signs that are being posted in um, specific areas to just let you know that those areas are being cleaned daily. Um, but they've kind of split up their workforce onto the day shift and the uh, early night shift. So um, if you don't see them in the daytime, does not mean they're not coming through because they're doing it in many cases, even in between some of the, um, the scheduled classes. On the PPE front, um, we feel pretty good about where we stand in terms of what we've got on hand, uh, but we just want to, as we reminded even yesterday on the email, to let folks know that uh, we do have PPE on hand on campus should anybody need them. We have an abundance of the masks, and we also have some personal hand sanitizers should anybody need them. Um, I know that, uh, I'm assuming many of you saw the uh, Governor Baker's new guidelines that were released yesterday that spoke to the uh, requirement of, as of this Friday, of masks being worn outside. But um, we just want to remind folks, if you need one, come to either the, uh, the public safety office in the uh, lobby of the Cowan Center or at the Cataldo building on the, the Bedford side, and we'll take, uh, take care of supplying you with some there. Um, we have been now for approximately two months um, testing our, some of our folks up at the university crossing the partnership that we entered into with the University of Mass uh, Lowell and the Broad Institute out of Cambridge. We have tested over a hundred of our folks uh, on a weekly basis. We send a, a group of them up there for testing on either Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday afternoons from 2 to 4 uh, p.m. We uh, thankfully uh, have been receiving extremely um, good results back from those tests, but um, a number of you have sought to have those tests done on a weekly basis that can be done we just want to make sure that we are addressing all of the face-to-face -face experiences first uh, whenever possible um, we have you know a number of our uh, students that are in the labs or the clinicals um, the nursing or the dental uh, labs have been accessing the tests um, and from all the cases from everybody that's gone through them it's been very uh, a very positive experience it's a self-administered test up at university crossing and up to this point, the results are back in just a little bit over 12 hours. Um, so uh, we just remind folks, anybody that does want those tests, to please um, send an email to the emergency management mailbox at middlesex.mass.edu, and we'll process your request that way. The last front, though, is something that the president had referred to in his opening remarks, and it's to keep people up to speed as far as what we're witnessing and experiencing on campus, um, kind of mirroring our our host communities and our, our, our neighbors around us, uh, many communities of which have gone into the red zones over the past two to three weeks. Um, we've definitely seen an uptick on uh, potential or reported cases on campus that have been coming into us through the mailbox. Um, a number of them um, are folks who are fully remote and haven't stepped foot on campus this um, semester, um, but some of them, you know, some of the issues we're dealing with is just making sure that the individuals, uh, whether they be staff, faculty, or students, are getting access to the health services they need, but also um, whatever support services they can get from the college. So Mary Emmerich and the folks in HR are um, helping with any uh, staff or faculty issues, and Pam Flaherty and her team are taking care of the student issues um, to make sure they get the support they need on the other side of this. We did have a positive test come back um, 
at the end of last week over the weekend. And um, the student is in quarantine and uh, has been off campus for weeks. Uh, but I am very happy to report that even like while this meeting is occurring, uh, the individuals that would have been in contact with that individual have um, gone for some of the um, tests that we provided up at the university. And at this point, all of their results are coming back negative. So very great news on, on that front. So um, keep our fingers crossed that we'll proceed on this track, but we do anticipate a continued spike. Um, we have a couple of others that are off campus that are reporting they've been exposed to family members and or individuals who, who tested positive. So um, we're trying to make sure that we can provide the support and uh, testing access that those folks need as well. Um, so we're gonna just keep on proceeding as, as we are at this point, um, but this is why uh, we thank everybody for adhering to the, um, the guidelines that we've got in place with having the masks on in place. Um, and I know that the folks over, especially in the, uh, the health sciences have been doing double PPE with you know, their, their uh, face shields on top of their masks. Um, in many cases, gloves. So um, those efforts are paying off. And we remind everybody, as we do every time we get this opportunity, to use whenever possible your, your cell phone to scan in with the QR codes, because that's helping tremendously for us to do contact tracing. Um, should anybody, um, should we have any positive cases that are involved with our face to face um, classes or, or any other interactions? So that's it from, from my end, President Mabry. Somebody could unmute. I got it. There we okay. go. Funny, got it. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and again, we are keeping on top of these issues and following through with the um, established protocols and uh, making sure that uh, safety is really important uh, to all we do. Okay, moving along here. Uh, next up is Mary Emmerich who will um, present on the presidential search process and update on where that is at this point. Yes, thank you, President Mabry, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share an update regarding the presidential search process. Uh, we are following Massachusetts Board of Higher Education guidelines and procedures for the search and selection of community college presidents. Um, it's very essential that communication between the Board of Trustees and the Commissioner's Office, as well as with the college community, is maintained throughout this process to help ensure a successful outcome of the search. Uh, the organizational information review is currently in progress. Isaacson Miller, the executive search firm we are partnering with, has been reviewing materials regarding the college's financial projections and budget strategic planning, presidential dashboards, accreditation reports, um, our organizational structure, and student information. This careful assessment of MCC's current status and future goals will help guide the development of a detailed position description. The search committee formation is also underway. The committee will be finalized by Friday of this week. This search committee will be a diverse working group with representatives from faculty, staff, and students, as well as Board of Trustees, community leaders from both the Lowell and Bedford community, and a representative from the Department of Higher Education that is appointed by the Commissioner. We have developed a tentative schedule with Isaacson Miller to establish and identify the key steps and milestones throughout the presidential search process. We are meeting with Isaacson Miller this Friday to confirm the scheduling of the scoping meetings and listening sessions with internal stakeholders, including faculty, staff, and students, as well as the Board of Trustees. These meetings will provide the college community with the opportunity to provide feedback and share information about this vital leadership position. We anticipate these meetings, as well as the search committee launch meeting, to be held the week of November 16th. Following the scoping meetings towards the end of November, the position description will be developed, reviewed, and edited to finalize the uh, president profile. 
The search committee, as well as the commissioner of the Board of Higher Education, will be provided the opportunity to review the position description for the new president prior to its publication. We anticipate the president profile to be finalized in early December. Are there any questions regarding the presidential search process at this time? And we can save the questions to the open Q&A period too as well. Okay, there we go. Now I can unmute myself. And um, I want to thank uh, uh, Mary and Patrick uh, for those updates uh, and really would like to um, see what questions we can answer today um, on any of the topics that um, we have uh, covered. So if you put those in the chat, uh, those questions then will be um, read by um, Beth Noel. Beth, what do you have? Hi, President Mabry. Um, we do have a lot of questions here. I'm going to try and clump them together in mm -hmm. uh, topic areas. Okay. Um, we will start with um, uh, the health and safety of staff during COVID. We have some questions regarding this. Um, one of the questions is that I requested a copy of the air quality report. Will the report be made available, not just the summary? Um, we can take a look at that. It is a fairly scientific and uh, detailed report, and the executive summary does really um, put uh, the, uh, the outcomes in um, more uh, can, uh, easily to understand language. But I'll check on that and see. I'm not sure what the reason for, for that is, but uh, we'll, we'll check on that. Another question is in regards to contact tracing. After an employee has been exposed to a family member who has tested positive with COVID, what is the process to being allowed back on campus? I'll have to defer to Patrick on that. Just trying to unmute here. We're, uh, we're beginning to actually experience that right now uh, over the course of the last week specifically. We've had at least two cases of folks that have been uh, in contact with a family member. What we're recommending is to um, is, is two steps. A, to consult with your own uh, personal physician. We recommend that in every single case here across the board um, to let them know what, what is occurring. But also, um, if you're not exhibiting any symptoms, we can provide a test for you to uh, get yourself tested up at University Crossing. So um, we would, you know, again, recommend reach out to your own doctor or physician to, um, to, to get some consultation there. But please, um, if you're symptom free, um, reach out to us through the emergency management mailbox and ask for access to a test so we can get you uh, in on one of those dates as quickly as we can. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I now have a question about the presidential search. How was the search committee put together? So the search committee is gonna be a diverse working group. It's really comprised of both internal stake, uh, stakeholders as well as external stakeholders, as well as representatives from the Board of Trustees. Um, individuals that were interested and expressed interest um, in participation, uh, their names were provided to uh, the chairman of the Board of Trustees, um, as well as the chairman reached out to um, kind of the leaders of some of the working groups across the college, um, for example, FSA, um, MCCC, um, AFSCME, um, to have those leaders recommend and make any recommendations for um, candidates to serve. So the committee is still being finalized um, and we'll be able to share um, kind of the search committee composition following our meeting um, with the executive search firm Isaacson Miller, uh, Isaacson Miller um, after Friday. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, now I have some questions uh, regarding the budget. Uh, first, 
the, the last town hall, someone had asked if we could have a list of positions that have been retrenched. What is the status of this list? Um, I'll, again, uh, I'll have to look into, I don't remember that question off the top of my head, but um, we'd have to see what the time frame is um, for that. If you're talking about this year um, or, you know, the last five years or, um, you know, I, I again, uh, might want to submit that question uh, to Mary in a little more detail and we could see what we can pull together. Regarding a statewide community college early retirement program, has someone at the Baker administration or in the legislature been contacted directly regarding this initiative or are we making an assumption about the willingness to review this idea? Uh, no, there has been um, questions asked and there um, basically was an indication that uh, it was not being considered. Before any more retrenchments, will you push for furloughs? Um, it's interesting with furloughs, they are a temporary um, situation that if we furlough people um, for a period of time, it only reduces our budget for that period of time. This is a longer term trend. And so we're trying to really focus on issues that are going to, uh, on ways to reduce the budget over the longer term. Um, you could say that in a sense, furloughs just postpone um, what appears to be an inevitability at this point. And, excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, we really uh, can't postpone some of those decisions much longer. In the last major round of retrenchments, academic and student affairs lost a disproportionate amount of employees. Will academic and student affairs face the same situation in the next possible round? Or will other areas be required to retrench? Um, will higher level administration be subject to retrenchments or just rank and file employees? Um, so one way to look at this is that student and academic affairs is the absolute core. And that's where most of the people at the college work. Um, and it is also the area that we're really trying to protect as much as possible at this point. Uh, we're really trying to make sure that we have those resources that will maintain our ability to help our students succeed. This is the, the hard part of what we do. Uh, academic and student affairs are the core, but the, the overwhelming uh, majority of the people who work at the college work in academic and student affairs. Um, all levels um, are on the table and we're looking at all levels across the college for any activities that we have to take. So this is um, always a challenging uh, question and um, one that we really uh, need to work on uh, actively. Again, as I said, we're approaching this from uh, the point of view is how do we really protect the key areas, the core areas of our college and do as much as we can there. Um, so we'll continue to look at that throughout this process. Thank you. Another question that we have is with respect to hiring freezes, recently staff have been promoted. Will promotions also freeze? What's happened with the pro, uh, promotions is the, the way we've approached this is where we have retrenched and reduced staffing, we have often had to give uh, administrators additional duties and new duties. So the concept we've worked on is that we do not, uh, if we have to give people more work, that's part of the, uh, what uh, has happened to all of us. If we have to give people different work, that's uh, another uh, uh, issue. And if we start adding new responsibilities and are rewriting their job descriptions, that is when people have been, had their pay reviewed. Why are we moving ahead to purchase the Pollard building? Um, 
we're uh, looking at the Pollard building because we think that uh, we already occupy 40% of that building. The building is in a situation where um, it doesn't look like uh, it's stable over the longer term. And we're trying to make sure that we um, protect, in a sense, the, the programs we have in that building and have a stable place for them. The other point is that looking at the ownership versus renting, it is almost a complete wash in terms of cost. So if we can um, have a better ability uh, to have a stable home for both the charter school and our college, uh, that seems to be the best way to go uh, as it's really the same cost. Uh, another question, by making cuts this year, will this help next year's budget? Um, yes, uh, in a limited way. Um, again, you know, to be perfectly honest, with some of the things we're trying to do, again, are longer term. So it's that the reductions are not going to just impact us in the short term, but will impact us in the long term. We're seeing long-term trends in enrollment decline that mean that we just we have fewer students and it's hard to maintain or impossible to maintain the same level of staffing if we have uh, significantly fewer students. So we're also looking at different ways we can think about how do we build our enrollment how do we uh, think about how we're utilizing our two very different campuses? How do we uh, think about creating some programs that feed more successfully into our academic programs uh, from uh, many different angles? Uh, I had uh, a chat with uh, the academic deans a couple weeks ago where they had some very creative ideas on how we might do some of these things. So really trying to think creatively, uh, not just accept the fact that our enrollment is declining at this point. One of the things we have to be cognizant of is the enrollment in our feeder schools. We have looked at the 25 top feeder school districts around our two campuses. Their numbers are not declining in any significant way. So there's still students out there how do we make ourselves the kind of place that they want to come to, that they will choose first, is really a challenge we need to take up and figure out how can we bring these students in because they are there and they're, you know, we want to be their first choice uh, as they go forward. So that's part of the conversation I've had with people that we really uh, want to make sure that uh, we are seeing a stable enrollment over the longer term. So right now, we're seeing this economic recession that has really um, heavily impacted the some of the communities we serve and many of the students we serve. We'll come out of that at some point, but still, we've had this longer term trend of declining enrollment that we really need to think about how do we get a grip on that and how do we stabilize that enrollment. Students are out there in the feeder schools. How do we recreate ourselves to make ourselves really more attractive to them? As a follow up to that question, why do we have a much more significant decline in enrollment than Northern Essex Community College? Um, that is a, um, if you look at the trends over time, um, they're, they're much more similar. And it's hard to say because they're, you know, it's hard to compare Lawrence with Lowell and with some of their other communities there. So um, interesting uh, question to ask and, and to look at. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to compare against one or another college and say, why is that one more than us and this one less than us? It's really that we want to look at ourselves and what we can do to challenge ourselves to make sure that our enrollment is stable over the longer term. I have a follow-up question to the Pollard building question. Sure. 
once the college has the Pollard building, will the charter school be paying rent? Um, we're still negotiating that with, uh, with the charter school and, and looking into that. Um, but uh, most likely, yes. But again, part of our role is to make sure that um, both institutions, which have a long history together and serve very important roles within the community, are able to go forward in a stable and successful environment. I think there's a lot of partnerships uh, we can work on there, but they are both compatible um, with the mission of the college. Another question, um, would letting go of the historic homes, homes help with budget improvements? Um, we have to realize that the college does not own the historic homes they are owned by the foundation. And so if we let go of the historic homes, um, the, uh, if they're sold, the, any of that finance would go to the foundation. The foundation is a separate um, 501c3 organization that can determine how they use those funds. Now, the foundation has always supported the college, has done a tremendous amount uh, to help us whenever we needed to. And I'm sure with additional funds, they would be um, helping our students and providing more scholarships in the future. But no, it would not directly impact our budget at all. Uh, housing and residential life often produce revenue for colleges. Is there consideration for purchasing nearby buildings and being the first community college in mass that offers res life to their students? Um, we haven't had any serious discussions about that, although we have done some work there at the Indian Conference Center with the RPP program. Um, at the moment, uh, that is um, impossible to run in the same format that it was because of COVID-19. Um, but it is an interesting um, proposition to think about in uh, a community. It's a lot to take on. Um, I've seen that at uh, other colleges. Uh, and also there are some um, legal hurdles that we would have to overcome to be able to do that. So not a simple proposition, but one that shouldn't be forgotten either. Uh, now I have a question um, about the election. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. What is your expectation surrounding faculty sharing their personal political opinions during class? Um, I think that really, um, you know, you get in some touchy areas uh, of academic freedom, wouldn't you say so, Mr. Provost, uh, you know, in this, and that I think that's really much more of a individual um, take on that. I'll tell you when I was a teacher, it was um, an open guessing game throughout the semester of exactly what Professor Mabry's political views were. I told them that I would all disagree with every single one of them, not because I disagreed, but because challenge was a way to explore and to understand more fully. Phil, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, the only thing that I would say, and I, I've sent some communication out with faculty about some other engagement activities that are going on, a debrief that we're having after the election tomorrow, an open forum, then Pam and I are running. I, what I would say from a faculty perspective that's really important is that students will be looking for stability, and your classroom is a place of stability for them. And I think it's important that, um, I'm not sure that, with all due respect, your individual personal views are critical to their learning. Um, I think that if you can facilitate an open dialogue between students, um, I think this is where an opportunity or a faculty member plays much more of a facilitation role. Um, we do get very concerned at any point where people who, um, we've had problems in the past with some faculty who decide to cross the lines and be very, uh, and very direct about their opinions and not accept the opinions of others that are in the class. And so um, it is one of those, be careful about the sage on the stage uh, approach to this. But I think it's really important 
that if you see students that are in distress, um, I would hope that you would find a time in your, in your class or in, in, in some portion of what we're gonna be experiencing over the next few weeks, to take some time to open up that discussion about that distress and to facilitate a conversation that would allow students to, to understand sort of what's happening. I think what's really important that the president has already outlined is be very careful about how we, and I think everyone has to do this, um, we address misinformation. Um, we're gonna try and address that as much as we can through the student app. We're gonna try and really let students share. But what our experience has been thus far during the pandemic and in 2016, um, if you recall, um, they, we had a tough time for about 10 days uh, after 2016, after that election. We had classes that were canceled. Um, we had many faculty that were in distress. Um, we had students who were in distress um, and people made the appropriate decisions that they needed to. But I think what's most important and I would hope is that our faculty are incredibly accepting of where our students are coming from and they're very flexible. We've proven that since everything we've been dealing with with this pandemic you're very responsive to students um, and students will look to you for a safe space to be. So I hope that we'll find that safe space as we run our classes, not at the expense of content, um, but certainly allowing for some open dialogue, well facilitated by a professional um, who, knows how to, who, to, who knows how to do that. And you all know how to do that very well. Thank you very much, Phil. I have another question that goes back to the uh, search process for a uh, president. And this question is, will there be a site for information regarding the presidential search to keep the MCC community up to date? Yeah, I can provide some information. There will be. Um, we're just um, having some additional engagement conversations with the executive search firm, uh, trying to finalize the schedule uh, with some key milestones and project steps uh, for the search process. So once that information is finalized, as well as the search committee um, participants, uh, we'll be able to share that information on a internal web page uh, that we'll provide to the college committee or community. And then that will also be the venue for any additional information or scheduling of meetings uh, moving forward as well. So I would anticipate this site to become available um, within the next two, um, two weeks. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I have two more questions about budget. Have there been any discussions of changes or sunsetting of programs that may be more costly to run? Uh, we haven't had any discussions on sunsetting programs at this point, no. Um, again, we did a review uh, using um, Gray Associates uh, several years ago, not too long ago, um, that really looked at our program mix and our markets. And really they came back with some very minor uh, tweaks to a couple programs. And so we really felt that this helped us validate the existing programs that we had and that the ones that, uh, you know, we have are the ones that are serving our communities and our market well. So um, that was sort of our way of having a outside entity look at these in an analytic way. And the results were uh, really showed that we are meeting the needs of our community and that we're, we're looking at, um, you know, what they need out there. So we haven't been looking at um, sunsetting programs. Tim, if I can just add that, so that people know that during that, that very comprehensive review, um, clearly, I think what people may re be referring to is what we're talking about is program mix. And because we are primarily a transfer institution, so many of our programs really focus from the liberal arts and sciences with concentrations, and those concentrations are based on the expertise of the faculty that we have. Um, they're the same faculty that also teach general education courses, which are you know, crucial to the core of the institution. We're not like Springfield Tech. We don't have a lot of um, what I would call boutique technical programs, uh, or, I mean, most of our high cost programs, quite honestly, and everyone knows this, is in, in, in the health programs. And that really has to do with really requirements to meet accreditation in terms of faculty student ratio. Um, Kathy Gailey and her staff watch that very carefully. Um, and we obviously have done everything we can to maximize those 
in areas that we want to continue to serve students, uh, make sure that they are successful, that they can meet the challenges of accreditation, which continue to grow each and every year. But I, I can't imagine the institution without a dental hygiene program. I can't imagine this institution without a nursing program. I can't, you know, I could go on with the list of health programs. They are central to the core of what we do. Um, anytime you visit any of those offices or hospitals, those are our students that are out there that are serving you. Um, so uh, when we talk about Northern Essex or North Shore taking another lion's share, we certainly would not want to put ourselves in a position that we would not. I can't imagine this institution not offering health programs, but the bulk of our programs are not high cost boutique programs. We've done that analysis very carefully uh, and, and we will continue to watch that. Um, I think we do have some work to do and the deans and I have been working very closely with all of you, the chairs and coordinators. Uh, all of us have been looking at fill rates, how we make sure that we have full-time faculty that have workload. Um, we make sure that we are not adding additional DCE sections um, before we make sure that everyone's workload is taken care of and that we have actually greatly reduced the schedule to be able to avoid cancellations. We've used proration. So we are using a number of strategies to be able to continue to offer the array of programs that we have. We've limited the number of specialized courses in that schedule. So I would just say that we've done a great job over the last four or five years, really taking a cold hard look at all of our programs and making sure that they are all viable and that they are all contributing to the revenue of the institution. Thank you, Phil. Beth, if it may agree, in regards to the voluntary options for reduced work hours or a 10 month work year, if someone chooses that option, how does that affect benefits for a full time person? Mary, if you could handle that, please. Yes, um, we're still uh, reviewing that information. Um, it'll be very dependent on the reduction that uh, would be elected. Uh, the goal would be that individuals can continue to maintain their benefits so they don't have any impact to uh, their credible service uh, with the State Board of Retirement, but also with their benefit elections. Um, so that'll be something that will provide additional uh, Q&A for when employees are considering these options. And then Mary, this might be one that you could also um, answer as well. Uh, does the college have a plan for professional staff the week between December 24th and December 31st? Yeah, we are. Um, that schedule, um, we are also finalizing um, those details. Um, I will be sending a memo uh, regarding that schedule, um, not only for our inclement weather that we may experience um, for uh, individuals um, uh, and just to share some detail on that. Um, is that uh, any, as we have in the past, any day that the would be inclement weather or a snow day, um, the college would um, notify the community and students uh, that the college is closed to allow for um, snow plowing and essential personnel to complete that work, um, but the, there would not be any on-campus activities. Um, additionally, we're looking at that period um, between um, the <clears throat> Um, holidays um, at the end of December and the New Year's uh, to look at what the schedule will be or if any um, uh, scheduled facility maintenance or IT um, maintenance would be needed at that time. So more information will come and, and be uh, shared with the college community this week. Because we are currently 90, over 90% 90 of our classes are offered online and staff is working remotely, um, can you explain why we would be having inclement weather days? I can. Certainly, I mean, I mean, what you understand is that we do have students that are coming to the college face to face. They need to make plans. They have uh, a lot of our lab courses or hands on courses. And we have students in the health programs that are out in clinical. And the earlier we, those students are uh, going to a number of facilities, the earlier we can make that designation, the earlier uh, we can allow students not to be getting into their vehicles and traveling to a clinical site. And this is how we just have to manage um, the sort of this balance of face-to-face -face and clinical. I know it may seem ridiculous for the vast majority of what we're dealing with, but we do still have a certain percentage of our students that are out involved in uh, clinicals and in face-to-face -face, and we must follow those guidelines. 
And also we have some faculty and staff who are required to be on campus for those classes. And then if you have some that have to come in or some that don't have to come in or some have to be paid and some don't have to be paid, it just gets too complex and inequitable. So it, was, uh, it seemed that the fairest solution at this point was to just stick with the policy that we have had in the past. We had these conversations with our unions and it just seems to be the best way to go forward at this point. And back to a budget question, mm -hmm. is there an estimated time frame on when the non-voluntary personnel options are going to be reviewed more thoroughly? Would this be prior to the end of spring 21 semester? Um, yes, it, it will be before the end of the, the semester and, and probably much earlier than that. Another question just came in. Is there a schedule for remodeling construction work being done on the third floor of the Cowan Center? Um, I believe there, um, there is a schedule for that. Phil, are you aware or would that yeah, be? Frank, Frank O'Brien, somebody may have more details, but we're not talking just about the third floor. That is a DCAM sponsored project primarily about lowering the floors. It's an ADA compliance issue. So Frank, I'm not, I know that they are going to begin sometime in the next couple of weeks, maybe you have a better sense of what that schedule is. Brian does. Frank and Brian, they're, they're barely here. Uh, Beth, did you find yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, this this the schedule is uh, to commence work early in the new year and to have the project completed uh, by the end of the spring semester, the early summer at latest. So Brian, I was in a middle school to vote today and they had stacks of boxes in the hallway of LED lighting. Um, like many of the institutions, they're using these breaks where there are very few faculty, staff, teachers, and students in the building to put in cost-saving measures and energy reduction uh, measures. It was interesting, the lights there were actually uh, from a company, it was labeled on the box uh, from the town in, in Pennsylvania where my sister lives. So, you know, you just go, oh, okay, North Wales, PA. All right, here we go. So, um, yes, next question. Uh, the next question is a follow up to the question about um, politics in the classroom. Uh, and it's, I, I believe it's meant to clarify the initial question. If a student expresses concern but is afraid to make waves for feel of retaliation, what is the recourse? Phil? Um. So Beth, just read that question to me one more time so I make sure I understand. Sure. If a student expresses concern but is afraid to make waves for fear of retaliation, what is the recourse? Well, I mean, I, I think the most important piece is how you as a faculty member facilitate that safe space in your classroom for that student. So when you start any kind of conversation like that, I think you have to, to address some ground rules and some conversational pieces so that student can feel like if they do express um, something that is controversial, um, how it will be addressed in the class and how it will be accepted. And I think that's critically important from a faculty perspective about how you manage those conversations um, when you have them. And, and, and people in different disciplines certainly are, in, are, are, are better prepared to handle those. I mean, when you're, you know, if you're, you're teaching ethics, uh, you do this all the time. Um, and if you're teaching sociology, I think there are areas where you also do this all the time. So I think there are, there are components and disciplines where faculty have certainly more practice at this particular component of, of the discussion. So I think A, you have to decide, is there space in your class for this to happen? B, if you do decide that you're going to allow for a safe space, you have to set some ground rules so that everyone's following those rules and that you have to be able to give a time limit about how long you're gonna spend having that conversation so it doesn't completely overtake your content. And, and, and C, I think you have to be able to facilitate and manage that classroom so that you shut that down if there are any particular student comments that are um, of issue for other students. And I, I, I'm not suggesting this is an easy thing to navigate, neither has the president in this. I just think that we know from experience, uh, we've been through this before after a volatile election in 2016, and many of you uh, were with us during that time. And, and so I think the idea of preparing for what may occur in these conversations, if you choose to open it up, 
has to protect every student that's in that room to feel that they have voice and that you have to be able to protect that voice and do that from a place of authenticity. And, and if you're comfortable doing that, then I encourage you to take the time to space. If, if not, then I think it is a, uh, it's an area that, of caution for you as a faculty member. And, you know, having been through this in the classroom myself, I know that, um, you know, these can be difficult conversations, but they can also be teachable moments. And sometimes students do say things that can be um, interpreted as offensive, can be, you know, aggressive. And that's when we have an obligation to really step in and say, this is not how we do it. And it really is important to us as, as, as a community as we strive to really find ways to talk through our issues and to work um, in ways that explore the ideas rather than accuse the people. You know, this is, uh, again, not easy. As Phil has said, it can be very difficult. It really is up to you in your classroom how you address these or whether you, you know, um, you choose not to uh, because you don't think this will work. But Really, um, you know, it, it is uh, difficult. I know that our Office of Civic Engagement has done a lot with students, really trying to get them together to find ways to discuss these in, um, you know, let's say civilized ways. Again, so that these are not personal attacks. These are how do you explore or even contest somebody's ideas, not contesting who they are or what they are. That's not acceptable. And we really want to find ways that we can talk through these issues uh, so that uh, students uh, learn through the exercise. Not easy. It really is um, very individual how people address this. And, you know, it can become um, tricky business. But again, these are important times and we'll do as much as we can. And President, maybe I just want to reference, I sent out to all faculty today, the November engagement activities, and you'll note that the uh, election debrief is happening tomorrow and the student forum, I believe, Pam, is the day after. Um, I can't keep track of dates these days, but uh, it, all those dates are listed there. So one of the things that you certainly could do as a faculty member is refer a student to those kinds of out of classroom conversations where they get a chance to have voice and express some of their concerns um, and, uh, and then not address that in your class and just suggest that these other events may be the better venue for students to be able to engage um, in a facilitated discussion about what's happening in, in our nation and what's happening locally and what's happening to them, what's impacting them directly. Okay, what else do we have here? Uh, with staff offices uh, or will staff offices on the third floor in Cowan have enough notice to clear out? before the, the work gets done? Um, I guess, you know, uh, whenever we've done any renovations like this, we've always given time, uh, people sufficient time. Our facilities team is very good about helping people um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, in supplying containers and helping move things. And it is, it's part of the process. Yeah, Colleen? Did you have something to add? There you go. Oh. Unmute. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I couldn't get unmuted. Um, and I, ju I just want to, in terms of the third floor, just so folks know, a lot of those offices, the floors are already lowered. So they're not in an area that, that uh, floors need to be lowered. So not all of those spaces will need to necessarily, uh, for that project, um, have to be packed up. But, but if there is any kind of other work that's being done in that area, people will be given, um, they'll be given uh, much, much notice and, um, and, and we'll assist with that for sure. Okay. I have another question about cost saving measures. Um, we work from home seems to be working for many areas. Is a work home from home policy uh, being considered for those that do not have to be physically on campus? Could that be a soft, a cost savings measure? 
Good question. Um, we are starting to have uh, some informal discussions, you might say, on the future of work at the college. I understand exactly what people are saying about the ability to work from home. Um, that has worked, uh, been very effective for some and less effective for others. Uh, and it, it, so it's not, a, it's not something that's always successful across the board. Um, not everybody has uh, sufficient space and you know, a good working environment um, at home. So there's just a, a, a lot of um, issues involved in that. Um, will it be a cost savings? I'm just not sure at this time. Um, as we, we all know, um, this, you know, it, there's no doubt that some of this is working very well. But I think many of you also realize there is a social element to our community. There is an element to us being able to talk to each other, to exchange ideas, to talk about how do we solve problems together. And there are, you could almost say every business in the United States um, is wrestling with this issue right now. So it's, it's a very interesting one about how do we uh, maintain that sense of community that is critical to uh, the, the college um, while still, uh, you know, working, you know, from home in some of these areas where you can, um, you know, really uh, work better, it works better into your family life. So this is going to be an ongoing conversation that, you know, we uh, look at. My best guess is that we may move into something that's more hybrid in the future. Um, you know, as I look at the senior leadership team on this, uh, you know, there are uh, many of the people are working primarily from home, but are on campus at times, just as I'm in my Bedford office right now. Um, Phil was on the Bedford campus this morning. He's in Lowell right now. And, you know, many of the people have uh, done that. Uh, so, I, again, um, not an easy question. I don't think there's an easy, simple answer to this. It's something we are going to have to explore as a college community. Uh, thank you. And we have um, two more questions that are related about um, being uh, virtual and remote. Um, first, mm -hmm. with Governor Baker's recent executive orders, if the number of COVID cases increases, will MCC be forced to be 100% virtual for the end of the academic 20 year? And what would it take for MCC to open its doors to in-person instruction? Okay. Um, it, at this point, um, you know, we haven't seen any um, um, direct guidance from the higher education working group on this. Um, we're uh, monitoring uh, uh, Governor Baker's um, steps very carefully. He has taken very careful and very scientifically backed steps to try and limit the spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, I can only say that I feel very lucky to be in a state where we have uh, a governor who has been uh, very uh, transparent and very forthright and has worked very hard to try to balance some very difficult issues. But we always know where he stands and he's very clear about this and very articulate and that has really helped us to uh, shape our guidelines. At this point, I don't see us going 100% off campus. Um, again, it's something we are watching very closely. We are very aware that cases are rising across the Commonwealth in a number of our uh, communities. So again, we will keep a close eye on this. Now, the other side of the equation is, um, when will we be able to bring more students um, back on campus? And again, where we see this happening is at some of the residential schools where they really can create their own bubble for the most part, where they really can um, um, actively uh, test students uh, sometimes as much as twice a week and that they can really um, do things that are impossible at a commuter school where students come in, go out. Our students are frontline workers our students are family mector, uh, members. This all creates a wide range of vectors for which a, uh, the virus could enter 
both their lives and our college community. So um, as we've seen, all the community colleges looked at this very closely and all 15 community colleges um, came up with basically the same answer that they would need to be somewhere between 10 and 20% on, uh, uh, on campus. And that sort of depends on their mix of programs because some have more programs that are specifically hands-on as Phil mentioned um, earlier. And so we're watching this carefully. The other side is with the basic guidelines of being able to be in a closed environment, um, even if you have masks on, the limited number of people, it means that, um, and if you look at the physical infrastructure we have, um, uh, Colleen and Brian and the crew went out and measured every single classroom in the college. Most of them will only accommodate four to six students at a time um, under the existing guidelines that are there. And that would be really, um, in a sense, financially impossible for us to run that many classes with that few students in them. Uh, so, you know, right now the equation is just a very difficult one for having students um, back on campus. It is the reality of the COVID environment, our physical environment, and the fact that we are a commuter school with students going in and out. So trying to you know, look at how we compare to UMass Lowell or a small residential private college in Boston is uh, really apples and oranges. They're very different environments and you know, we have to make different decisions. That said, I don't think there's anybody on these screens who wishes this was over and we could bring our students back on campus. That really is our goal to find a way to do that as soon as possible. Um, as Phil, and you might speak more about this, has built the schedule with um, mini masters at the end. We've talked about if things start to let up in the spring, we might be able to do more scheduling on campus, but also have more student events on campus in the spring. But we just don't know what's gonna happen there yet. I hope that answered um, uh, those questions. If there are any follow-ups, I'd, I'd be happy to entertain them too. Complex issue, um, as I've said before, we're, we're always trying to balance keeping everybody safe and um, helping our students succeed. So just to follow up, just, and I think many of you know this, that we, we now have used uh, mini master two in our semesters to um, deal with e earlier cancellations within a semester. And I think we've got, you know, some early parts to the summer as well. And we're looking at specifically um, one of the summer sessions that may allow us to, um, I guess what I would say is before we build summer, we're trying to identify a way that we might uh, get a better sense of sort of the science and the trends to be able to consider bringing more people back on campus if that's possible. And, and I think it's just going to be a wait and see, which is more complicated depending on how we develop the schedule, but we've even had some conversations about how we might be able to set aside a component of summer um, and be prepared with mini master two for addition. So we are, we are on the lookout for doing that um, whenever it is possible, as the president has mentioned, and students really want that to happen as well. They, they've expressed that, that they, that they miss uh, sort of the face-to-face -face interactions in the community that, that you all have been so brilliant at establishing here at the college. And that's, that's part of why we're, we're potentially seeing, uh, not only because students are having financial issues, but I think that there are many students who want more direct contact with their faculty and other students. So we're very sensitive to figuring out whenever we can do this, how we might be able to do that in the most safe environment that we possibly can based on the physical resources that we have in terms of our own space and size of classrooms. What else do we have? We have one um, last question mm -hmm. and it is about um, working remotely. Because working remotely is new for most of us, will there be an opportunity for reviews or feedback from staff for staff that supervise employees and will there be supervisory training um, that can help support and move the college forward? Um, that, uh, very interesting question and something we've um, touched on a little bit, but I have to say have not looked into uh, deeply. Um, and we know that uh, 
supervisors are working um, closely with their staff in many areas to um, help people find ways to work effectively uh, and efficiently in these remote environments. And everybody has been really uh, sensitive, but also, uh, you know, uh, working um, actively with their staff members to um, find a way for uh, people to, uh, you know, do the best job they possibly can within this difficult environment. And so at this time, we've really left it up to the managers to do this. Um, but it's a good suggestion to think about how would we train managers to uh, work in this. I'm not sure if Mary or Phil have anything to add to this. The only yeah. thing that I would say that I think would be really important is, is an individual assessment. Like I, as we've started talking about uh, the possibility in different areas of like virtual work plans, um, I think it would be important to take a look at your job description or your current E7 and, and see what, what parts of it are you not able to do um, the, in a new virtual remote environment. And I think that that is a great place to have a conversation with your manager um, and for managers to be having those conversations individually with folks who are, you know, either frustrated by what's in their E7 or job description that they can't currently accomplish or how they're beginning to find some really creative ways uh, to accomplish that virtually. I think both of those are important conversations. Sorry, Mary. Yep, and, and I would just add in and, and put a plug out there for our LinkedIn learning. Um, the college has for all um, faculty, staff, students, everyone, um, an opportunity uh, to really engage in the, the modules and training that's available in LinkedIn learning. Um, there's lots of topics, um, including, you know, kind of leveraging um, tools and resources and, and connection and communication um, in this virtual working environment. So that's definitely a huge uh, library of resources and, and portfolio that can help not only um, with these uh, um, kind of topics that we've shared about uh, remote working, but additional, um, you know, if there's any other um, skill development, um, using Excel, using Zoom, using um, any of the um, kind of tools uh, at our avail um, as we move forward and become more effective and, and successful as um, at continuing to engage our teams um, remotely. So uh, again, uh, I, uh, LinkedIn Learning is, is a great resource. It's new for the college community. So definitely look at that and there's opportunity to set um, and build your own individual um, training portfolio, not only from an individual contributor, but also for, for managers and supervisors. Great, thank you for that. Are there any more questions, Beth? Yes, the final question. Sure. Is MCC trending towards adding more mini-mester courses in spring 21 and fall 21? Mr. Provost? Yes, um, and in fact, I think we were really clear with folks as we started working on the schedule that that was part of the analysis. I mean, what, what we need to do is make sure that we don't do this too um, haphazardly. We're also trying to do a review of completion data from the mini masters, which so far has trended uh, fairly strongly, um, but we're also concerned about that in specific disciplines as many faculty are. So um, no bold moves, um, but we, as I have said, used mini master two specifically as a strategy for students and, and for canceled courses uh, and for student requests for additional sections. So we've been monitoring it very carefully. Most of those additions have come from on the ground data that we've gotten from advising or from specific uh, data analysis that we've gotten from each of the divisions. Uh, but I think you will see, and you have seen, a growing trend in Mini Master 1 and Mini Master 2. But it's not as if we're turning the whole schedule upside down and we're not talking about 50% of the schedule being done in this fashion. So I, I don't think we're moving boldly. But yes, we are seeing an increase in both Mini Master 1 and Mini Master 2 based on the trends of where students are registered. OK, great. Okay, I think that was the last question. And uh, at this point, um, I just want to uh, have uh, the last slide up there. Again, I wanted to thank everybody for attending and thank you for your questions. 
having an active dialogue really helps everybody at this college and we really appreciate your questions. As you know, some of your questions make us think through things better, make us consider our options, both while we're on this session and afterwards. So your input is extremely valuable and your questions really help us a tremendous amount. So I really appreciate that. And last slide, please. Um, I just wanted to mention that tomorrow is the Slam Your Vote Poetry and Fiction Reading and Contest. Contact Professor Tom Laughlin if you're interested. There's more information on this also uh, on the MCC Newscaster. So uh, this should be a good event, might be a great outlet for people um, who really, um, let's say we're all going to need an outlet tomorrow. That's for sure. Okay. All right, thank you everybody. And thanks for the team here for putting this on. Please stay safe and please stay well, everybody. Thank you everyone. We will post a recording of this to the president's website as soon as it's ready.